So I'm not a perfect host. Uh, I've been hosting for many years now, but I think I would consider myself a pretty good host. By the way, before we get too far into this, this is the earliest I have ever recorded a Rob Built video. 9.31 a.m. You proud of me, Dad? So anyway, I made a lot of bonehead mistakes. I've, I've really messed up many times in my career, and ultimately, I'm really happy that I did. A lot of new Airbnb hosts or people looking to get into the game tend to overcorrect by over-researching and reading everything and watching all the Raw Built YouTube videos. What's next? You're not gonna like Chipotle burritos? Like, it's freaking crazy. And they're just, they, they're just so scared of making a mistake that it stops them from ever starting an Airbnb business. But for me, in retrospect, so many of the things that have ever happened to me or any of the mistakes that I've ever made, I'm actually pretty thankful for them because they've made me a significantly better host. And now I get to teach hundreds of students in my host camp mentorship program on how to avoid some of the mistakes that I've made pretty early on in my Airbnb career. So I wanted to compile a few and maybe hopefully help you, and maybe, and maybe, <laughs> help you avoid some yourself. Ultimately saving you headaches, gray hairs, time, money, all that kind of stuff. So you're welcome in advance. And you're probably gonna wanna stick around until the very end because the last one is one of the biggest mistakes that I see Airbnb hosts make. Also, if you're interested in becoming an Airbnb host, if you sign up with my ambassador link down in the description below, you'll get $75 when you host your first day. And if you wanna learn a little bit more about Host Camp, there's more information down there too. So with that, let's get into the biggest mistakes that Airbnb hosts make. And VRBO hosts and booking.com hosts and hip camp. Oh, all the hosts, every host out there, these are the mistakes that they make. So here's the number one thing that I preach in host camp and pretty much to anyone that's getting into Airbnb. I get on a soapbox about this, so I'm gonna start strong here. I'm gonna start with the biggest mistake that Airbnb hosts make, and it is taking cell phone photos of their beautiful property. They stage it, they spend $20,000 on furniture, they spend half a million dollars on a house, they spend their life savings, their passion, their time, getting this Airbnb ready to list, and then they say, hey, why don't we cheap out at the very end and save money and take photos on our cell phone instead of spending three to $500 on a photographer? <coughs> don't do that. Don't do that. That's a, I don't have a spray bottle, but if, if I did, I would be spraying you in the face right now if you've ever thought about taking cell phone photos to list your Airbnb. Now, let me clarify a couple things. If you're listing your place and your photographer can't come out for two or three weeks, that's totally fine. Take cell phone photos, get it up there, get it listed, start making money. But make it a priority to get new photos taken and swapped. So I wanna give you a very clear example of what I'm talking about by putting my own listings here on blast. I was gonna go and find Airbnb listings that didn't have professional photos, but I figured, you know, I've actually gone through this process where I took cell phone photos photos and how to pro come in and reshoot them. And I just want to show you the difference between professional versus cell phone. And I want you to know that photos are the single most important marketing tactic that you can employ for your Airbnb listing. So let's jump into my tiny house in my backyard. These are all cell phone photos. And honestly, like, you know, they're fine, but like this is an even level. You know, I don't have a wide angle lens. So it just all around looks kind of crummy to me. Um, again, it's fine and it works. And I put these listings on Airbnb and it worked. However, as you can see, I took these photos at night. So I'm just not a visual person. I was in a rush. I didn't even care that it was nighttime. So I want to show you what the pro photos look like now. My friend over at Barker Studios took these photos. And if you ever are in the Southern California region, I highly recommend him. But as you can see here, like this is what it looks like to have several megapixels here just everywhere. And it's actually edited and it's retouched. And now it feels like the tiny house is no longer 300 square feet, but maybe five or 600 square feet. And I don't say this as a, hey, let's deceive people into thinking it's bigger. I just mean that when you have a good photographer with a wide angle lens, it just really works wonders for your listing. All right, moving on to Casita Conejo, my tiny house in Joshua Tree, California. Again, cell phone photos here, not bad. They're, they do the job. Obviously you can tell that the tiny house is nice. We got a gallery wall that I took here. <laughs> Again, I took photos at night. So obviously that's my theme. Oh, here's one in the daytime. Now let's see what the professional photos look like. Again, also taken by Barker Studios. Boom, look at this little cutie. This photo right here, like literally this photo is the reason why I've had any success on YouTube. Number one, how dare you? Because this is like the thumbnail for my first like semi-viral video. And it just goes to show you that one photo can like change your life. And I just really feel like this photo was a catalyst for a lot of my success. But as you can see, now the space is really coming to life. It's bright in there, it's airy, and it just, it feels so tasteful and well done in this tiny house. And here's the final photo here, which is probably the best photo in the house. But I wanted to end with a small little anecdote here. When I was moving from LA and I was gonna rent my house here, I took cell phone photos and I had my listing up for a month. Not a single request, okay? Then I got professional photos taken and the moment I put those photos on Airbnb, I got three or four requests on the first day and then I ended up booking someone that day who ended up staying for like three months and it ended up turning into a $10,000 reservation. So that three to $500 that I paid turned into the greatest ROI I've ever had on Airbnb. So take professional 
professional photos or I'll unsubscribe you from this channel myself. And also, if you haven't subscribed yet, consider hitting the subscribe button down below and the little notification bell and you'll be notified anytime I make videos coming at you for not taking professional photos. Going to kill you, Chad. Oh, no thanks. All right, now big mistake number two that Airbnb hosts make all the time is bad listing copy. So I've already established my passion for good photography, right? Well, on the flip side of that, you don't wanna just look good, you also wanna read good too. <laughs> Well, oh, you want to read well. You want your, <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, you want your listing to read well. Does that make sense? Whenever I'm looking at people's listings, they always say, hey, what's the best way to market my Airbnb? Should I start a social media account? Should I start my own direct booking website? Should I take out Google ads? All that kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, nope, it's actually a lot easier than you think. Good photography, good listing copy are gonna be the two most powerful marketing tools that you have for your Airbnbs. Specifically because you just want people to understand what they're booking. Okay, it looks good now, but now they wanna read it and understand the space and understand the story that your photos aren't able to tell. So I just picked a random market here and pulled up like five listings and I just wanna show you the difference between what I consider good and bad. So looking at here, we got like a cute little cabin here. Awesome. This is it. This is their only description copy that they have. It's a tiny little paragraph. I'm not even gonna read it because I know that if I read it, I still won't really know what this place is, right? So I'm gonna move on to the next listing. Then we get into this place. Again, a cute little rustic cottage type of place. Click on here. And I've got a tiny little intro paragraph here. I literally have one sentence about the space and then like one tiny sentence here. So as you can see here, I can read this, but I might have questions about, are you on septic? What kind of access to the property do I have? Are there any animals on the property? Is there a pool? Is there a hot tub? All those questions that I might have from the photos are not gonna be answered here. And not only am I confused, now I'm gonna message that host and I'm gonna say, hey, I saw in your photo that you had a hot tub, is that operational year round? And now you as the host have to take time out of your day to answer a simple question that you could have answered by taking five minutes to include it in your listing. All right, mistake number three that most hosts make is not being incredibly fast responders. And that just means that, you know, when you get a reservation request, you should be answering it as soon as you can. Cause you never know how many hosts that that guest has reached out to. That guest has reached out to 10 different hosts. Then honestly, it's gonna be a matter of who responds first. And if someone else beats you to the punch, then more than likely, you're gonna lose that reservation. I often say on the channel that time is money, and I mean that in a bunch of different regards. And one of the ways that I mean it is, if you take way too much time to respond to someone, you're gonna lose out on that reservation, and it's gonna cost you money. The fourth mistake that I see Airbnb hosts make all the time is being in the weeds of their listings and not really automating large portions of their business. Now, you can't automate every single component of your Airbnb business, because if you did, then your guests might think that you're a robot, which you might be because you're ultimately still gonna to wanna to have a personal touch to your Airbnb listing, right? But I'm still a really big advocate of automating things like your messaging, automating things like your cleaning schedule so that you don't have to text your cleaners, automating leaving reviews for your guests, automating your pricing through dynamic pricing. Honestly, all of these things are things that I struggled with for a very long time because I'm just like a very stubborn person and I hate giving up any kind of control. And so for me, the idea of automating my messages and not having a personal touch on every single message and not being able to mess with the pricing and then communicating with my cleaners like these were all things that I was scared to let go because I just really felt like the moment I automated that stuff my listing was gonna drop in quality but what I didn't realize was that it was actually the opposite by not automating all of these different components my listing was dropping in quality because so many things were falling through the cracks like forgetting to text my cleaners like forgetting to message guests their checkout instructions and reminding them that checkout is at 10 and then I would have guests that checked out at noon because they just never read the listing and they didn't know when checkout was and then my cleaners would show up and have to like nicely kick them out because they had to clean the listing and get it ready for the next guest and then those guests were a little annoyed by that interaction and it's just like a whole thing right like this is just one little example here but this can happen so many times in so many different combinations and just another thing off the top of my head here with pricing for example like I liked controlling the pricing and being like the evil scientist and testing out what price points would work and then I would price a weekend super high and I would just forget because I have like 14 different listings and then I would say well why hasn't this weekend booked the day before and I'm like oh it was at 500 bucks of course it wasn't in a book and then I'd have to drop prices and I wouldn't be able to book it in time and I would lose money as a result. So all to say, I've been having a little bit of PTSD here from like Rob when he started his Airbnb hosting journey. I've just learned the hard way that when you try to control every single aspect of your business, you actually lose control of it. So for messaging and cleaning coordination and review automation and all that kind of stuff, I like to use Guesty formerly your porter. And also I do wanna quickly clarify that this is not an ad, I actually use Guesty. And also, if you sign up with my link down below, you'll get $100 off for the next couple of weeks. And then if you're late seeing this, it'll be like $20 off your first billing cycle or something like that. For dynamic pricing, I use Price Labs. I've used a bunch of different ones and they all work fine, but Price Labs has my favorite interface. And for me, if it's easy to use, then I use it. And since we're here and we're dropping links already, if you want $10 off your first month, you can sign up with my link down below. 
Okay, number one, two, three, four, five. Oh man, this is a big one. <sighs> don't do this, don't do this, all right? Don't do this fifth mistake that I see Airbnb hosts, myself included at a certain point, and that's offering discounts. I've said this on the channel before, but I really have to reiterate that offering discounts, it, it seems like a good idea on the surface because you're like, well, I'd rather make 80 bucks tonight than nothing, so let's just drop the price. But the people who ask for discounts are always, not 100% of the time, but like 99.99999% of the time, are the most high maintenance and highly critical guests. And they're the ones that leave me the worst reviews and they're the ones that text me at odd hours of the night asking for something tiny or complaining about something that I've never heard anyone complain about. My dog went to one of your parks and ate another dog's feces and I'm going to sue you for that. And it just, it really, it just ends up burning me time and time again. So please just do not do it. Do not offer discounts. And if you ever ask for discounts from your Airbnb host, please just don't do it. Like we have a business. You don't go to Target and negotiate on your toothbrush, do you? Do you? I know it's a very specific example. This isn't Pawn Stars, okay? This isn't Pawn Stars. It's like, hey, best I can do is $120. Hmm, yes, except no, they're gonna burn you and they're gonna break stuff and ah. Uh, just do not do it. For the love of God, if you're listening to me, Carl, do not give a discount. Woo! Yeah, this is probably one of the things that I actually legitimately get annoyed about. I don't like it. I just think that it sets a bad example. And literally, like, I'm sitting in a studio right now where I once had a guest stay in here, and she asked me for a discount, and she said that she went to my college, and I was like, all right, let's do it. You can stay in my, you can stay in my studio, no big deal. And then she called to Airbnb and complained and said that there was a stranger breathing in her closet. <laughs> There's so much more to that story that I actually want to tell, but it would be too long for this video. So if you want the follow-up on that story, let me know, and I'll probably make it. All to say, I do have strangers that breathe in my closet, just not that specific time. Mistake number six here, that's going cheap on furniture. Uh, I'm not really gonna belabor this one too much because I talk about it all the time, but when you buy really crappy furniture, guess what? It breaks and then you gotta replace it. So just spend the money one time, buy nice, cry once. No, what is it? Buy once, cry, buy once, cry once. There it is. When I first started my Airbnb business, I was like all about saving money. I was buying stuff from Target, Ross, Ikea, all that kind of stuff. And then I was going on Craigslist free and you know, I spent so much more time trying to furnish an apartment that while I did it on a budget, it looked like hot trash and everything broke and I had to end up replacing all that stuff anyways. So just spend the money on nice furniture because it will actually make you more money because A, you're not spending your time, which is money, replacing it, but also it makes your place look better and photograph better, thus it will book better. Now, number seven here, letting a bad review ruin your week. You know, I've been here many times. I've gotten many bad reviews. I mean, I've hosted thousands of people at this point. I've gotten terrible reviews across the board so many times, so many times in my Airbnb hosting journey. It's very easy to get bummed out about it. It's very easy to say, oh, I'm not cut out for this. And it, it will ruin your week if you let it. You have to really focus on the good reviews you have. On one account, I have 2,500 reviews. 2,400 of them are good. 100 of them are probably bad. If I just spent a day and read those 100 bad reviews, I would just quit hosting. I would be so sad about it because people are just so mean with their words. Poop. Your poop mouth. Poop out of your mouth. But if I just spent some time coming through the other 2,400 reviews, I would probably shed a tear every now and then because I do, I do. The reviews that people leave you are so nice and they spend so much time writing you a very long and thorough review. So remember why you do this. Read those and understand that you're helping other people make memories that will literally last them for the rest of their lives. Memories that they make with their friends, with their family, over beers, in a hot tub, looking at a view, whatever it is, like you are a part of that. So if you get a bad review, shake it off, fix it. If there's something that needs to be fixed, fix it, but move on, learn from it. And I promise you that the harder reviews won't cut so deep like in a couple years from now. I'm, I'm not really phased by them these days, but every so often I do have to track them down and take a baseball bat to their knees. What? Mistake number eight, number eight. We're on mistake number eight. That slaps. Mistake number eight would be not networking with other hosts. I actually didn't realize that this was like such a big deal for me until I started networking with other hosts. I was kind of alone in my Airbnb journey for the majority of it, honestly. And then I started a YouTube channel and a lot of hosts started reaching out and I was able to connect with them. And then I started Host Camp and literally connected with like hundreds of hosts all over the world. So for me, I think it's very important to surround yourself with like-minded entrepreneurs that are in your niche, right? And so when you can talk to another host, you can vent with them, you can celebrate their victories with each other, you can swap insights and POVs and pricing strategies and hosting philosophies and revenue numbers, all that kind of stuff. I think for me, I get most excited when I'm connecting with an Airbnb host and we're just like geeking out about Airbnb features and updates and all that kind of stuff. So I honestly think it's very important to connect with other hosts. I would say that there are a lot of Facebook groups out there. They're all very negative for the most part. It's usually hosts that just like don't like their job. Be very 
careful about the Facebook groups that you join. Unless, of course, you're part of the Host Camp program that gives you exclusive access to the greatest Airbnb Facebook group of all time. Number nine here, canceling reservations. Just don't ever do it. Uh, if you cancel a reservation, I think that is a big mistake because A, it's gonna ding your Airbnb like record and it'll actually affect your Airbnb SEO. You'll play slower on top of that. They'll block those dates out from being able to be booked again by somebody else. And on top of that, you ruin someone's like possible trip. Like if someone books your place and then a week before you were to cancel on them, now they have to go and find a new place. But if it's like a really popular location like the Smoky Mountains, there may be literally nothing available or if they're there is something available, it's extremely expensive, and now you're making that family or that group of friends pay significantly more than they would have had to have if you hadn't canceled on them. So be a man or woman of your word and honor a reservation at all costs. The only time that I've ever canceled on a guest was for inclement weather. That would actually, it would have been dangerous for them to go to my Airbnb listing. Other than that, rain or shine, I let a guest stay there. The other day I had huge plumbing issues and the water was coming out brown because our filter broke and instead of canceling, I said, hey, I can cancel this or if you're okay not using the water in the house, I'll let you stay for free. And I wanted to give them the option before I canceled on them because they'd already planned their whole trip. And honestly, they were super, they were like, great, we'll bring bottled water, no big deal. We love camping. This is like a huge step up from camping. And so that was like a really great resolution because I almost just canceled it without even running it by them. All right, I have a few more here, but 10 is a nice round number. So we're gonna just end on this one. And that is splurging on the wrong things. This is a mistake that I see Airbnb hosts make all the time. And they spend money on like a nice Vitamix blender or they get ultra premium sheets, which is like a very nice thought, but sheets are something that you're going to be replacing like all the time. And so if you spend 70 bucks on a set of sheets, you're wasting $70 because you're going to replace it in a month anyway. I actually had a student one time that was going to drop like a thousand dollars per mattress. And I was like, I was like, whoa, do not do that. And they're like, no, I just want them to be super comfortable at night. I think it'll be a premium experience. And I was like, yeah, but you don't need to spend a thousand dollars up. Just spend like 300 bucks on a mattress from Amazon, Zynus, Sleep Signature, Oli, whatever it is. Right. And I was like, spend your money there. And he was like, oh, I had no idea that those existed. And I literally saved him like $3,000 with a two or three minute conversation about mattresses, right? Because he wanted to splurge on super premium mattresses. I'm a big fan of stocking a kitchen, making sure that it's got all the right utensils, but also I see hosts that just go all out and buy every single kitchen utensil, like garlic presses and lemon squeeze. I mean, a lemon squeezer is probably fine, but like little nuanced things that people will literally never use. And also there is a fine line between like spending a good amount of money on furniture, like I often advocate, but there's also a moment where you're spending way too much money on furniture. Unless it's a very luxury premium experience, you don't need to spend like $1,000 on a credenza, all right? You can probably get it done with like three to 500 bucks. So choose your battles on where you're splurging. I'm all about splurging. Oh, actually, just thinking about it, Caleb said really nice towels. He likes when Airbnbs have really nice towels. I'm a really big fan of Costco towels. They're like 24 bucks for a pack of six. They're very nice. But I've also seen hosts that do like super premium towels that are like $12 a towel. And I'm always like, why would you do that? When a guest that has like purple hair or red hair or any kind of dye in their hair, they're gonna stay in your town. You're gonna have to replace it. And then a lot of people like, will ruin your towels and just throw them away and never tell you that they ruined them. So there are like certain things that I'll die on a hill for. Choose your battles. Like I said, all for splurging. Just make sure that you're splurging on stuff that's gonna last you throughout the years and not something that's gonna be replaced every couple of months. And with that, that's it. That's it. That is... Woo, that was it. I just relived like my whole first four years of Airbnb hosting. And honestly, I do miss that time. I'm always very jealous of hosts that are getting started because you got so much to look forward to and so many things to learn. Um, it's not like I'm not learning, but I do miss like the light bulb going off for me like every single week and figuring out something new, some way to level up myself as a host. So with that, I hope this helped. If you're an Airbnb host, let me know if you agree or disagree with anything I said today. Just know that if you disagree, I'll block you from the channel. But with that, thank you so much for watching. If you wanna learn more about Host Camp, my mentor, Worship program. I'll leave a link down in the description below. And uh, I guess that's it. I'll catch you on the next episode of Raw Built. Bye. No, no, no.